What's the longest attendance been in a room with you, do you say? 14 years. Wow. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. Uh, he, most of them die. I get up in the morning, I've got to go and kill, a, uh, do a bit of killing. Careful with the word, Jim. <laughs> yeah, uh, by buying property. What's the most money you've ever made in a year? Uh, so, Jim, how many tenants do you now have? I'm down to 500. Down to 500? Yeah, a simple number to remember. I had 1,000 a couple of years ago. Yes. But I sold off a lot of the properties and 500 HMO tenants, about 10 single lets. Yeah. Most of them, are, it's HMOs. And what, what's got you downsizing? Uh, a very large uh, potential check uh, caused me to do that, where I got offered an obscene amount of money. Right. Uh, and uh, unfortunate confession is they conned me. But having got down the line of selling, I uh, ended up selling quite a bit off uh, and now back it to where I was before with a smaller portfolio. So in terms of the, the downsizing the portfolio, part of that portfolio was sold to one buyer or did you? Yeah, it was sold off to one buyer, okay. uh, social housing, Yeah, who was supposed to, uh, yeah, probably less said about yeah, that. The that's, fine. that's fine. And uh, how long have you been doing this now? 32 years, started in 1991. Remember it well. Yes. And uh, I think I was at Wolverhampton, I'd finished in Wolverhampton University at that time. So when's enough enough then? So there's 500 tenants, I'm guessing, you know, they uh, pay you reasonably well. No. Um, they don't. No. They don't pay, oh, you, they they pay, don't pay well. you well. Well, they don't pay me well. Uh, the money in this business is in capital appreciation. Yes. Uh, unless you do it small scale. And you do it all yourself and you don't cost your labor so hmos um, uh, work very well uh, when you do it yourself don't cost your labor and you have five ten maybe even 20 hmos that would probably work when you're my size you've got staff mm. and you've got the inefficiency and, uh, and difficulties running it it's why social housing costs so much uh, they provide the housing and they probably charge or cost five to ten times as much as I do. Yeah, I'm providing the same kind of yeah. <laughs> so the same kind of tenants, very much blue collar, uh, unemployed. Uh, though I'm moving away from the unemployed. I used to be known as uh, housing housing benefit tenants. While I probably only housed one in the last three months. Right. So it's mainly working people now uh, because that makes life much easier. All my problems are housing benefit tenants. Yes. So, but again, a house, I don't want to knock housing benefit because that, it can be a very good market. I always say my very best tenants are housing benefit tenants and my very worst are mm -hmm. housing benefit tenants. Because you get a really good housing benefit tenant, uh, probably over 50, work most of their lives, will stay there for their life, Yeah, no problems, grateful. And then you've got the rest who uh, unfortunately have this entitled uh, view or just uh, uh, dysfunctional and cause you all kinds of problems. And do you think that's it is split by age? The older uh, ones are less likely to cause challenges. They're later in life. They don't want to change constantly. Yes. Or do you think I, it's not just simple as that? Well, the, mod, the the ideal tenant I have is over fifty, work most of their lives, lost their job, the wife kicks them out. They're Black the ones. Baggers, I think you used to call them. <laughs> Binners, yes. The guardian slating me for saying that. Yeah. Uh, binnets, as we <laughs> refer to them. And I was trying to be uh, kind and say, look, these poor people turn up. They've uh, been really looked after by their wives, and the wives got fed up with them. Mm -hmm. They've had the car, the house, they've had the kids, and they want to change their lives. Mm -hmm. So they kick them out, and these uh, husbands who, to a certain extent, never really grown up. Yeah. They're still very much children. They've gone from their mum to their wife who've looked after them and they go, oh, I don't want to do. And I put, don't worry, mm. put them in my bed sit, give them a cup of cocoa, tuck them up and no problem at all. They're just happy, grateful, uh, have no ambition to do anything else. It's a bit of a sad situation to yeah. say, but it's a business that works yeah. as a model very well. Half a dozen in a house, no problem at all. What's the longest a tenant's been in a room with you, do you say? 14 years. Wow. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. Uh, he, most of them die, but this one uh, retired and went back to Poland. Okay. Uh, very grateful. Uh, and it goes to show I have a policy of not raising the rent to existing yes. tenants. Yes. Uh, and in 14 years, that property went back 
on the market, I was charging him £40 when he moved in and he paid that for the whole length of time. Put it back on the market, £120 a week. Wow. So it goes to show how much uh, property went up. Yes. But that's the exception. I mean, you, you couldn't run a business like that if you held the rents because most of them, unfortunately, leave. Um, I don't know why they go on about Section 21. No sensible landlord uh, wants to evict a tenant. Section 21 is no fault eviction. No one wants to evict a tenant. I want my tenants to stay. In fact, if you could pass a law tomorrow where it says tenants have to stay forever, I would love that because mm. uh, I don't have a problem. It's the turnover that's the biggest cost you have. And that's the great advantage of single lets. In my area, single lets, tenants last for decades, while an HMO, the average is about a year. Yeah. And you've got to remember that year is averaged out by the tenants who've been with me 10, 12, 15, uh, 14 years. Uh, but most of the tenants only stay months. Yeah, for most of us, it's less than a year, about nine months. Yeah. So you mentioned Section 21. Why do you think landlords use Section 21? Because you, 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 I agree with you in the sense that why would you use it? Why do you think it's so uh, heavily used by landlords? Because lawyers are frightened to use the fault eviction. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've got this idea that if you evict for the real reason, which is most of the time non-payment of rent, yes. um, people go on about antisocial tenants. But my experience has been every antisocial tenant also doesn't pay the rent. So we're evicting them really for antisocial behaviour. I'll tolerate a bit of uh, non-payment of rent. People run into difficulties, uh, go through a bad patch. So I, I accept a level of rent arrears mm. is where they stop paying and willfully refuse to stop paying because we've got this wonderful system in this yes. country called universal credit. Mm -hmm. If you can't afford to pay the rent, the state will pay. So there's no reason why you don't pay the rent. It's uh, at my level. I don't know where other, uh, other situation is. So you go to uh, a lawyer, they'll go, well, they could come up with disrepair if I try to rent uh, for rent arrears. Because if I was defending clients, I'd say, you're not paying the rent for disrepair. But it never never actually materialises. I've evicted over 350 tenants, probably near 400 now, okay. through the courts. I've A lot more I've asked politely to go and they've gone. So that's a lot of tenants. But you remember, I've been doing this 32 years. Yeah. I've housed probably over 20,000 tenants in that period of time. So there's a lot of tenants. I'm in and out of court probably once a week mm. to evict tenants. And it's a system that's bureaucratic, it's slow, yes. but it works. But lawyers will go, no, use Section 21. All that's going to happen is Section 21 is going. So for those landlords who are worried about the loss of Section 21, you're going to have to start using fault reason, which is the reason you are evicting the tenant. And it will, the real reason why tenants are being evicted will come to light, which is not because landlords want their houses back yeah. and all the rest of it. It is non-payment to rent. It's a broken social. system, so the Section 21 is an easier route to get the property back. Yeah, I don't think it is because you've got to give two months' notice. Uh, while it's you... easier than a Section 8. No, it, it's easier to do Section not? 8, in my okay. opinion. And I've done it. We, we tend to go the Section 21 route. You do. But yeah. That's because you've, you're used to using it. Mm. But if you used Section 8, as soon as you don't pay the rent, you give two weeks' notice. Yes. You're in court within six or eight weeks. You, you're still waiting for the two months' notice to expire on the Section mm. 21. How long does it take you to... Once you... The two months has expired, which is usually about three months because it has to end on the month mm. and all the rest of it. Does it take you to actually get your possession order? Well, if we've got a problematic tenant, they'll drag it out for months. It's yeah. quite rare. I mean, we, we try and be quite fussy about who we're putting in the first mm. place. Um, we're careful with the vetting. It doesn't mean that it's a perfect system. There'll always be people that slip through and sometimes people's circumstances change. But what we try and do is work with a tenant when there's a challenge. Mm. Um, and uh, help them to, to, to move on in the sense that, you know, in some cases we've even incentivized them to move on because it's mm. cheaper for us to do that Correct. than it is to drag yep. it out through the court for months and months. Absolutely. Uh, right. And at the same time, we'll do a small claims court as well separately mm -hmm. for the uh, debt. So it applies additional pressure. If there's a guarantor, we'll be all over the guarantor mm. as well. So we try and use multiple routes just to try and get the property back quickly. Yeah. If someone's not yep. paying, you know, yep. as you said, we want the property back and have uh, let. Chug it up, yeah. I mean, the easiest way is just to say, please mm. leave, forget what you owe us, uh, go and rip off someone else, which is but unfortunate. It's un unfortunate. That's the way the system. Mm. It's the way the mm. system works. And then the government's concerned about why there's a lack of accommodation and 
landlords are not picking up this slack, but they're not the government's not incentivizing encouraging landlords to be landlords in fact they're de-incentivizing them correct uh, and i don't know who's going to pick up the uh the, the mess uh with all the, the shortage of accommodation well that's to our benefit i mean we ought to actually uh send the government a christmas card because they are <laughs> doing better i mean look at this area rents have doubled Rent, rents have gone crazy yeah. absolutely I mean, crazy yeah. i haven't seen the enormous shortage yet so i'm still uh i don't have people queuing up for my hmos um and uh, i forever asked for houses and then i've had a couple of houses and it took me a month or more to rent them which right. i find a bit strange because yeah. i thought oh these will fly straight out but they didn't um so there's still a lot of slowness in the uh in this area mm -hmm. i mean other areas that may be different there's just uh, you have a queue you know let something just like that mm. but uh i'm north of birmingham place uh, it's called the black country you can almost call it a black hole it's uh, no disrespect to the people in the black country or not but it is quite sort of um, not as economically challenged as many other areas but i go as far as dudley over to Walsall, up to wolverhampton and down to west bromwich that's my patch uh, and it's still slow uh, but this still that also presents interesting opportunities um um so we've done quite well out of those areas out of the black country generally mm. because i think sometimes there's more opportunities there than there is in a vibrant city like like birmingham um i mean we first met when somebody introduced me to you i think it's about 12 or 13 years ago i was trying to work it out this morning i think about 12 13 years ago uh, and i spent some time with you it was a few days you may not remember it's a long time ago now and uh, we had a look at some of the properties what you were doing because i was interested in understanding hmos and making money from property that way and uh, I tell the uh, story sometimes that uh, you just scared the hell out of me, and I thought well, I am not doing HMOs. <laughs> uh, oh I, I, I just I, and I left it for about six months or a year before I, I kind of picked up the idea again. But I, I did. I, I generally was. I'd come back thinking uh, I, I'm really not sure that you know we could do this. How, how is it even possible? Um, I just I, I just thought it was just so stressful and so much headache dealing with the stuff day to day. How do you find it? Well, I obviously survive and happy, cheerful, uh, laid back. Uh, Jim, so... <laughs> I, I don't put Jim Halliburton and cheerful in the same sentence often. <laughs> no, people don't. I mean, you can usually tell a landlord because they're miserable because it does grind you down. I hope I rise above it. I've got staff who take care of most of the day-to-day uh, -day stuff and you just got to learn to rise above it. Um, but if you worked in a busy pub, work on the railways, the abuse you get on that type of thing. Everything has a problem. You voluntarily put yourself into that situation and you just have to accept it and just uh, be calm about it. So when you drive past and you see little Johnny putting your telly in the back of his car, you think, ah, oh, I'll just make a note that it looks like he's leaving. Um, and little Johnny will carry on through life doing what he's doing, scamming people and being an a, a, a unproductive member of society. Well, in 20 years' time, I know that property will doubled or quadrupled yes. in value. So who's who's winning out of this? You have to stand back and realise, yes, you're going to get a lot of knocks as being a landlord. And we're getting even more with abolition of Section 21, the Section 24, uh, reduction on tax relief, the loss of the admi administration fees, the loss of the 10% wear and tear, the increase in licensing, the Article 4. I don't know what on earth it's all about. But it's actually of benefit because you're in the market. It just makes it harder for the competition to come in. Mm. And it's just going to make it more and more difficult. Your limit is, uh, unfortunately, how much tenants can afford to pay. Blue collar workers, there's a, a formula. You just never charge more than 50 percent of the rent to a tenant because it becomes unaffordable. Of unaffordable. Net income. So, net oh, income. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a sort of golden rule. So you can't push the rents up too far. But it's unfair. I, I feel um, probably in my old sort of left wing days, youngster and idealist, idealistic, what the government's doing is helping people like myself who are landlords, but from the good of society, you really got to uh, put a stop to all this. Mm. You got to uh, uh, take away all the restriction on landlords, uh, take away planning. If you shot all the planners, take away the green uh, belt, then the uh, housing will become really affordable. 
But yeah. then I would be out of a business. Yes. No one would yeah. want to live in an HMO, but they could live in a house. Because so, there's no shortage of land. There's no there's shortage of land. There's what Correct. maybe 5% of the country is built on. 2.5%. 2 percent Two and a half percent. Do you know that more than more land is given over to golf courses? Really? Which gives you an idea yeah. of where you are. Yeah. So, yeah, you drive, you fly over England, green, and, uh, green country, it definitely is. There's plenty yeah. of land available. And then you've got things like um, Bristol. They've discovered, hang on a minute, You've got all these council houses with enormous gardens. So we'll build a little shed in the bottom garden, pre pab built it there, use that as a way of creating accommodation. Right. Well, I've been doing that for years, but the yeah. planners come and make me knock I, it down. I remember seeing someone else. <laughs> and you've got other, um, in London, they're going on about sheds in the back garden. What's yeah. the problem? You're providing housing, low-cost housing. What is your difficulty? It's, it's just a dysfunctional system, which uh, unfortunately... Uh, <laughs> is uh, impacting on the uh, on people who want accommodation, and it's caused by the government, mm. and yet they blame landlords. <laughs> we're, we're solving the problems. Yeah. So, do you think the time of the landlord is now over? So, somebody who's thinking about becoming a landlord, do you think the opportunity is still there? Do you think that's it? It's it's really not viable anymore to be a landlord in this climate, a new landlord. Well, put it this way: if I start again from nothing, I become a landlord. Really? I can't think of any way that's easier to make money, and I'm talking about obscene amount of money within a sort of 10 to 20 year period. Forget about working 50 years for a pension. This is the business to be in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do share trading, but who wants to spend their time in front of a, 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 a computer screen? I can't think of any better business. Most of my tenants are wonderful, they're grateful, you're providing a service, it's a worthwhile thing to do, wake up. You go work out and the front share screen, it's just betting, mm. whichever way you want to put it. What else can you do? Go around scamming people by selling, I better not mention what product it is, because I'll have people complaining, but selling people things they yeah. don't want that have really no value and just using up the resources of um, uh, the country, raw materials. While I'm taking, uh, most of the time, empty properties, and I don't want, uh, it's not necessarily I'm using empty properties as a policy. It's just that these empty policies are cheap. Mm. Uh, properties, properties are cheap. Yeah. So they're easy to do. And the great thing about HMOs is people don't necessarily want a garden. They don't want parking. If they can afford a car, they wouldn't be living in an HMO. So mm. you can take properties that are derelict, make productive use of them. It just wins all the way around. You're recycling materials. Instead of demolishing the building and building a new house, you're using an existing property. Yeah. Uh, um, in all ways, it's good. It, it's just becoming much, much more difficult to become a landlord, and particularly an HMO landlord. It's almost regulated out of um, existence. Uh, you have just have to learn what the rules are, how to survive, and uh, once you know that, it's not too difficult. It's just more more complicated. When I started uh, 32 years ago, all you had to do is find a house and chuck some beds in the rooms. Yeah. Lounge became the bedroom, the rest put a few locks on. Yes. Now, <laughs> you'd be locked up for doing something like yeah. that. I remember when we were at university, uh, it was it was around that sort of time, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, I remember sitting around the four of us in our shared house working out how much money our landlord potentially makes. Yeah. We should buy houses. We had these bright idea mm. and we went looking around Wolverhampton mm. at the time we were living in Whitmore Reens mm. and the houses were £20,000 mm. £22,000 and that's it so at that time when you started what did you think would happen to the market I mean the prices have just gone absolutely mental over the last three decades but I'm guessing you didn't you weren't expecting that you didn't know that what were your expectations well the reason I got into property to start with is properties went up and had gone up uh, it all started when I was about 20, I think I was about 71, and property prices were so cheap, and I just watched them rise, go up and up, and I always wanted to get into the property business because I, I realised I would make far more money. Um, and if you carry on, it, it goes beyond your capability. If you think property's going to double every 10 or 20 years, and you're buying properties now for a uh, a quarter of a million. If you bought that 20 years ago, you'd b bought it for uh, probably 50,000. That just go, rolls on and rolls on. Uh, it, it goes beyond your comprehension. I mean, you, I was stupid to sell. Uh, property values would go up. So I shouldn't have sold anything. 
because give it another 10 or 20 years, I'll be uh, twice as wealthy. <laughs> and property, we always talk about house prices will double 10, 15, 20 years, whatever it is. But do you think it is sustainable compared to what they were when I think about what my father paid for his first house and some of the figures you're talking about? We're not talking about hundreds of years ago. We're talking about three, four decades. Do you think it's really sustainable that the prices will continue to, to double? Well, put it somewhere, someone's gone back to 1066 and said it's been going on <laughs> since then. So yeah. past performance is not indicative yeah. of future performance, but it has. That's why I did it. In 71, I was living in a bed sit in Clapham and the landlord there was complaining that he had bought his first house seven years previously and only paid 3,000 for it. Wow. So seven years previously, he's now paying 21,000. Uh, and I remember him whining on uh, he had this sort of whiny voice and <laughs> saying, how can it be affordable? It's now, it, this pro uh, property has gone up seven times in seven years. And I remember thinking at the time, maybe I should go into property. He said, it's not sustainable. The story has been said so mm -hmm. many times. People haven't got the imagination to realise what's going to go on. But does it matter if it's sustainable? You don't buy, you look upon capital appreciation as something for the future, and the trouble is, the future, sorry to say this, Sarge, we're all going to be dead. Yeah, so, that's, true. that's the only certainty in life. You <laughs> yeah. ain't going to be here. So um, unfortunately, that's something where you never know when you're going to die. So when do you cut your losses or when do you cash in? I don't know. Uh, when you've got prices going up, it's a dilemma that you face. Do I sell? I did sell, um, but I didn't make the money I thought I'd do, but I'd been conned. Uh, I didn't realise the market was full of conmen in that. Uh, when it comes to dealing with sales. Uh, but I still did all right out of it. Um, it uh, uh, enabled me to do what I like doing, which is buying more properties. So mm -hmm. I'm still having a bit of fun doing the things, still expanding. Uh, why? Well, we've got to do something, and I yeah. enjoy doing what I do. It's fun. So would it be fair around. to say you never, you'll never stop doing this? Uh, I never say never. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, I might just um, something might happen or something will change. I've seen too many landlords leave the market. It's usually they get a knock. Um, we we we're slow to adapt. I think everyone has that same. We, it's something when you get older, you just not flexible, and something comes along that changes. So I remember when uh, the Housing Act came in in two thousand five. Lots of landlords left. Two thousand five, sort of a long time ago now. Yeah. Um, and then he changed when uh, housing benefit became universal credit. Landlords pulled out the market. There are always landlords pulling out the market. This is the first time since 1980 you've got more landlords leaving the market than joining the market. Mm. The market shrunk by 2.5%. I mean, what's the government doing? But the government are just, uh, well, put it this way, uh, if you think the government care about housing after the war, uh, the Labour government destroyed the private rented sector. Before the war, 90% of people lived in private uh, housing. By 1980, um, ni uh, ni when I started in 91, it dropped from 90% to 8% yeah. uh, over that period. And it rapidly declined after the war. Labour government just outlawed it. The Conservative government, no one would believe the Conservative government would do so much such things to landlords. Mm. I mean, it's unbelievable. The um, I think uh, the well, it's approach. Margaret Thatcher that made uh, buy to let such a, a popular concept. She did because yeah. when we look across Europe, France, Germany, places like this, they, they, it, it just isn't the same. The market no. there. It's only in the UK we have this fascination about buy to let, and of course, as I say, with all the things going on, that that's starting to change. Some of it's shrinking. What's some of the biggest changes you've seen over the last uh, three decades you've been in this business? Then do you think biggest changes? Um... It's just become over-regulated. It is so, so much more difficult. As I said before, when I started doing HMOs, you just chuck beds in the room and people were grateful. You know, wallpaper peeling off the wall. Yeah. yeah it's home from home. The, the light bulb, you know, the old incandescent bulb yeah. on a, the old corded cable just sitting there, no lampshade. Yeah. That would rent. You couldn't rent that today, even yeah. to um, the unemployed. They want something that's really nice, sort of posh furniture like this. Um, it, we have to dress all the rooms uh, before that. And before, they were just lucky to have a bed chucked in the corner. Yeah. Now you've got it beautifully made up. So it's it become, a, uh, in some ways, a lot more competitive, more over-regulated. Lenders were 
when I started, you really had to buy cash. Mm -hmm. uh, there was no other way of buying property. It's very hard to get finance. And then it became very much easier. Lenders, I'm not quite sure where they are. Um, I have to follow the rules. Not that I ever didn't follow the rules. Don't ever get that idea. Stretch the rules. <laughs> uh, you take advantage of them. But now the lenders are enforcing the rules while before you'd look to the local authority to yeah. chase up housing standards and whether you've got planning, whether you've got building control. Now the lenders are becoming much more pickier. Yes, um, the solicitors want to go yeah. through everything with a fine tooth comb. Correct. The APC rating, yeah, your it. relevant planning approvals yeah. for various things, your licenses, everything. And you mentioned EPCs where everyone's, a lot of people are very worried about EPC ratings, which is a waste of t a time. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And one of the many cons is energy conservation. As I always say about conservation, so the three, first three letters that's right, it's a con. Because I have so many properties, I can measure. So I've had properties, um, what they call it now, uh, insulated, yeah. outside insulation, double glazing, uh, roof insulation, A-rated boilers. And I measure the energy used before, because every week I measure the gas and electricity, mm -hmm. and it makes no difference. They're still consuming the same amount. Still consuming the same amount. Okay. The only thing that actually saves money, and here's a tip for landlords, if you're worried about your energy bills, put prepay meters in. Mm. You'll see a drastic change in the amount of electricity used by the property. It halves because tenants start Conscious. switching off. Yeah. Uh, up until then, they don't worry yeah. because the landlord's paying. So that is one of the biggest ways of saving yes. uh, on I remember energy. when we actually, I vividly remember when we went around to look at one of your properties, it was a HMO, went in, the room was very warm and the window was open. Mm. And you said to me, that's how the tenants uh, cool the room down. Yes. <laughs> yeah. They will do. Yeah. Open the window. That, that's unfortunately the, the way. But trying to be... Uh, 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 you can get all these, what they call hive, nest, uh, yeah. ways of you can measure the yeah. heating and you can turn it on and off and all the rest of it. I don't bother. I just leave the central heating yeah. running 24-7. Uh, have you found your energy bills then in the last year, uh, the, the gas and electricity costs, especially on a large portfolio, even a small change can make a big difference? It would do, uh, yeah. I've just been very, very lucky, and which is probably the sum total of what I, uh, uh, for my whole life, I've been lucky. I fixed my prices mm -hmm. uh, right. so very few of the properties have made much change i'm still paying 16p a kilowatt for electricity wow. can't remember what i pay a per therm for the gas where they have changed they've gone up by um, 75p is for a kilowatt so i was paying 15p now paying 75 so what's that five times the amount for the electric bill um yes that that is a, a concern but i don't see it staying up there I think it's going to come down. Uh, it, it's not uh, sustainable, but yeah. who knows what's going to happen in mm. the future. But it will drop. They won't go back to 15p a therm, uh, kilowatt, sorry. Uh, but it's, it'll still be more. You, 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 you hopefully can put the rent up to cover that cost because mm. it's not a major cost. Uh, mortgages is a, a much bigger cost. Yeah. That hits impacts far higher than uh, the electric costs. So in terms of future, then you touch on the future. What do you see as the opportunities in the coming years for people either involved in property or looking to get involved in property? Where do you see the opportunities? Uh, I don't really know. Um, I'm not one for being able to predict the future. You, it's very hard to tell. Yeah, I've I said I think the cost of energy is going to come down. Um, I think we're in a decline. Everything goes up mm -hmm. and goes down. Empires are created and they decrease. Everything has a move. I think we're seeing a decrease in the market of for property. I think it's the end of the private landlord. But whether that's going to take 50 years, 20 years, 10 years, I don't know. But it's still a market, even though it's on the slide, it's going to carry on down. I can't see the government changing its policy or being attacking landlords. Uh, that will continue. Um, uh, the reason I was able to sell easily my portfolio was social landlords have been given billions of pounds to buy my properties. So these people are coming in saying, well, we don't care what we pay. We no. don't care what the condition is because we've given all this money to do it. And I'm looking at it and I think, well, why are you buying my properties, my tenants, 
and the government are giving them billions to do it. Yes. It, it's, it's a crazy system. And I can see them carrying on because they have no sense. I mean, who elected these people? I don't know. But I'd sit there and look at your own conscience. Yeah. Why aren't you questioning it? You are destroying the private rented sector for political gain. I don't know. But they're doing lots of things that are just crazy, which yeah, make I, no sense. I agree. They're definitely damaging the, the, the rental market, the private rental sector, um, in, in such a way where a lot of landlords will get to the point where they'll just leave the market. Mm. And then there is going to be a, a problem in terms of accommodation. Who's going to provide that? There are a few large organizations, Lloyds and such, who are committed to becoming large landlords. Um, how, how do you think that's going to pan out? It, well, they, they are, but the cracks are showing. Um, the people who bought my properties are having financial problems because they're relying on what's called enhanced housing benefit, yeah. where they get three times what I get paid for housing exactly the same tenant. And, and it actually gets crazy. If you would say, where would you look? I'd probably look to be a social landlord because mm -hmm. I've got tenants where I'm getting six, well, I struggle to get 60 pounds a week from them, yet they go or go back or have been housed by people who get 2,000 pounds a week. 2,000 pounds wow. a week to house the same person. Uh, the reason they end up with me is they're dysfunctional, they get kicked out. Um, and I look at these landlords um, and chat to them. I remember talking to one of them. I said, look, you're getting £2,000 a week to house care leavers. Mm -hmm. And he goes to me, Jim, you don't understand. I've got to feed them. I've got to give them Christmas <laughs> presents. I've got to take them on holiday. I thought, if you pay me £2,000 a week, <laughs> I think I could afford that as well. Yes. But the government do this. They have no, there's no rationality, uh, rationality to what they're doing. It's just an insanity approach. Uh, to the business, but it still doesn't put me off. I still go back into property, even though I know it's on the slide, because I don't think it's going to disappear any day soon. Um, and you make money while you can. Mm. Nothing lasts forever. Everything, uh, it's not as bad as gaming, where the whole market changes within about three or four years. And what was uh, the game or whatever it is, I don't play games, but there's a, uh, there's a faster changing market than property. Property will stay, it will still be valuable. I still think properties will continue and rise in value. If you can get hold of property today, fill your boots full of it, and then if you sell up in 10 years' time, you'll be selling at twice the price. And there's so many techniques you can use to acquire property. Most people come into property and buy for cash, mm. but you and I know that you can buy for a pound. Yeah. Um, what they call them, purchase lease options yeah. or whatever it is, I just pay a Controlling pound. the property, yeah. You control the property, get the agreement to buy it in a year's time, turn it into an HMO, go to the lender. The lender will lend you more than you uh, buy the property. So you agree to buy the property for 100. Once you've got the tenants in there, you can do the same with commercial property. Yes. Once you tenant it, it then valued on the income. One of the great things is what we call valuing it on income. Some, I think Rob Moore said Investment it's one. Value. Yeah. The seventh wonder of the world, or it's the eighth wonder of the world, is having properties valued on income. So take an empty property like this one. Yeah. If it's an empty property, it's worth... It's sat empty nothing. for about seven years. Seven years. You then put tenants in, you've got an income, and then it becomes valued at 10 times its income. So maybe you could pick it up for, say, 300,000, fill it up with tenants. It's then worth a million. The lenders will lend you 70, 75% of that. So you're borrowing 750,000 on a property that only costs you 300,000. Yeah. You walk away with 450,000. And there's not many businesses you can do things like that. With. There's not many yeah. businesses you could do that. You're absolutely right. Uh, and it's and, scalable. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. you have because you've got the money. That's how I did to start with. I uh, bought cash to start with to get myself started. And then market started lending uh, very, very slowly. And that's how I was able to keep on building up a portfolio yeah. on uh, original <laughs> inputs of 35,000. What's your, what's your thoughts on... Um, strategies like service accommodation, short stay, Airbnb, how do you think that's changing the market now? I laugh. <laughs> I, I run courses on uh, how to become an HMO landlord and many people, including yourself, said, oh, it sounds like too much work. It's uh, You put me off, Jim. Uh, I'm sorry initially. I initially put you off <laughs> yeah. uh, to doing this. Well, you try service accommodation. That's, that's 10 times harder than running HMOs. We run both. Then. Service accommodation is definitely much more work. Yeah. It is far harder. However, yeah, much more profitable. It's not only more profitable, it's more systemizable. Mm. So our service accommodation business is much more systemized. The volume that we do 
with the number of staff, it's far fewer staff than at the HMO business. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe I'll have a chat with you about yeah, that one. That's a, an off-camera conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have on that. I do a bit of service accommodation, but my son tends to run that um, and uh, makes a nice little uh, living out of it. Uh, but mm -hmm. I haven't got into it. Again, it's it's changing. Uh, I, I think we were talking beforehand. I said I'm looking to get more into into storage. It's another thing. There, yeah, there's opportunities to be had. Um, it's just m making it happen mm -hmm. and have putting the time and energy into doing this. So those people right now, they've got say a small portfolio, a handful of properties. What do you think they should be doing at the moment? Do you think they should be growing? sitting tight, downsizing, what do you think, moving so, sideways? I, I, uh, so I wouldn't presume to advise anyone with a small portfolio. Do what you feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I just feel, I get up in the morning, I've got to go and kill, a, uh, do a bit of killing. Careful with the word, Jim. <laughs> yeah, uh, by buying property. Yeah. To me, it's, it's almost an addiction. Yes. Um, so uh, I've just been, uh, as I said before, to see the solicitor signed to complete on four properties. Um, to me, I, I just enjoy doing that. I have that sort of compulsion to acquire. But I'm also conscious that the fact is I can handle that. Other people find it very stressful. Yeah, yeah. Um, we talk about getting into property. It's not understanding property that's so important. It's getting your uh, motivation, your attitude, your mental attitude towards de uh, dealing with this. And to other people, it's a nightmare and it's, it's stressful. And the more properties you have, the more stress. So if you're comfortable with a few properties, you only need a half a dozen HMOs. Yeah. You're made for life. You don't need anything more than that. You don't have to own the world. Uh, I just like doing it. And if it's fun, I'll carry on doing it. Once it stops being fun, I'll stop doing it. Yeah, most people get involved in property do it not because they're interested or fascinated by property it's the income that it generates in order for them to be able to do other things with that money there's right. very few people i guess like you and i that love the the yeah. the, the property side of the business uh, as well mm. for most people it's just the money it generates yeah well i think they miss out on a bit of life yeah life's too short to do something you don't like doing yeah i made that decision that's why i stayed in lecturing for a long time i just love doing it and that's uh, why I like doing courses, uh, talking. I, I enjoy it. Uh, it's a pleasure. So I don't really feel I work. Uh, to me, every day is doing what I like doing. It, uh, some people like playing golf. Go and play golf. If you're just doing it for the, the money, I, you, you're probably missing out on mm. a lot of that. Go and do something that you want to do. So if you've got your small portfolio, do what you really enjoy yeah. doing. Um, and if it's breeding cats, breed cats it's uh, uh that's what you want to do or if you like walking go and walk if you like traveling go and travel uh, it's what you want uh and it suits you life's too short to do mm. anything else so if someone's thinking about getting started in property now where do you think they should be or what type of strategy type investment location do you think they should be thinking about yeah the, my imagine I haven't got a, a wide enough imagination to say, oh, these are opportunities. All I can say is, this is how I did it. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm still doing it. You can do the same. Uh, I can show you how you can do this, and you can do as well. And I've met uh, there's probably thousands of people I've helped get into the property business or put off for a while, <laughs> but still got in. Only for a short while. <laughs> for a, a short while. Um, uh, put it down to Jim, helping them do that. Yes, but I'm not saying I'm the only way of getting into property. There's others, I say, light service accommodation. What I can't understand is people doing rent to rent. Mm -hmm. That's stupid because you're missing out on the big advantage of capital appreciation. Do rent to buy. Same thing, but you're just uh, agreeing to buy the property at the same but time. But on a rent to rent model, um, I know you're not a big fan of it uh, because you're missing out on the capital appreciation, yes. which is a core part of investing in property, which is what you mentioned right at the beginning. But if it creates really great cash flow, and the owner of the property is a holder, not somebody that ever wants to sell, isn't that still an opportunity for somebody to create great cash right. flow? Yeah, great cash flow, but you're working for a living. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, if you're, you, it's nice to have a point where you say, I've got wealth that I yes. can just live off for the rest of my life. 
you, you just have to carry on working on that or get someone else to run your uh, yes. rent or in portfolio. Yeah, you've get got in. the income but not the wealth. You're missing right. out on the other, so, the, the big piece. Yeah, But it's okay to start with. I, 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 probably if I was to say I have my time again, you start with HMOs and then move into single lets, which right. I feel are lent, let and forget. Yes. Um, my mistake was to just keep going with HMOs and not bothering too much of single lets, which I... Probably that's probably a regret. Like yes. Many I have that you could do. So you mentioned earlier about teaching property. And I said, I, you know, you're yeah. one of the first people I learned uh, from, uh, particularly around uh, HMOs. Uh, what's your thoughts on uh, the, there's so many um, property experts in the industry now. Everyone claiming with social media, everyone claiming to be a, uh, a property expert. Some people may be doing it a long time. Some people for five minutes and uh, have expert status. What's your thoughts and view on? I'm just jealous. <laughs> I, mean, I look at some of them and I think you've got very little property, very little property experience, but you fill the rooms up with people yeah. um, and you do do that. And I think I've got the experience. I've got all that. And um, I'm not as successful. They're just very successful at selling themselves mm. and doing well. And if it gets people into property, there's nothing wrong with getting into yeah. property. It's a, a great business to do. Um, they're making a, a, a lot of money out of selling courses. Uh, good luck to them. Uh, as, as I say, I can't think of any better business to be in than property. If I would, I'd probably do it. I'd enjoy doing it, and, and that's right. So I've got, uh, I say, quite envious of these people who do very well at it. Uh, they just have the ability to sell themselves well, which unfortunately... <laughs> I seem to put people off. <laughs> yeah, it's a skill of marketing. Yes. Great, some people are just great marketeers. Correct. Mm. And that's uh, something I've, I haven't uh, achieved. As I say, I put you off and that's often the story I have. I'm too real. No, but I'm too, I think the interesting but... thing is just to, to complete that story. I was fascinated by what was possible with HMOs. My only other experience was when we were at university living in a, in a HMO. I looked at some of the properties, some of the things you were doing and the potential income was mind-blowing what was possible um but the the potential headache that came with it i wasn't sure whether it was the right thing for us mm. but a few months later i'd kind of learned about a few other different ways and mm. then i settled with actually we're just going to focus on what we think are uh, professional nicer tenants create a premium product mm. and then it just evolved from that mm. the basic concept was, uh, was still there mm. jim if you could go back to your younger self what would you do differently I can't really because uh, my younger self was a very frightened. When I started property, and I started quite late in life, um, in 91, uh, I was very timid. I was very shy. What sort of age? Uh, uh, without giving you age away. Yeah, um, I think I must have been 40 okay. uh, to do that, uh, do the maths. Yeah, I think I was about 40. Yeah. Uh, and I remember thinking at the time, I've done nothing. Okay, I was a senior lecturer, so that was pretty good, but it, it, it really didn't uh, float the boat. And that's when I got into property, because if I'd, I realised that if I'd done that back when I was 20, I could have retired at that point. I'd have uh, the income. Uh, not, not that I'm particularly motivated by the income. Uh, it, there's a difference between having lots of money and not having enough money. If you haven't got enough money, you, you feel um, uh, uh, very, um, you struggle hard. Yeah. Once you've got enough money, it, it doesn't really matter too much. It's sort of slight difference. And I, I, you don't go mad and spend more or anything like that. It's just once a, you, you're, you're financially free. Um, I'm still the mean type uh person i always was but that's unfortunately scottish breeding we are proud to be tight um so i would have if i had gone out a bit and played harder i could have uh bought more property um i would have be, uh, been able to retire in 2004 when i gave up full-time lecturing so 91 to 2004 13 years later if you think the first property i bought uh, well, the second property I bought cost me twenty five thousand. Uh, in two thousand four, that was worth over a hundred thousand. I wish I'd bought a lot more of those properties, yeah. and uh, I would have been uh, uh, achieved what I wanted to do faster. So uh, I, I wish I'd, I'd played a lot harder, but I didn't have the confidence that I have today. So you, you, as the old saying, you can't put an old head yeah. on young shoulders. 
So I, I probably wouldn't have done anything different. Um, I regret all the deals I didn't recognise at the time. Um, I mean, same day remortgaging. Mm. I don't know if you yeah. uh, heard about that, but uh, there was a lender out there called Mortgage Express who would lend you the purchase price, or not the purchase price, they'd lend you the val uh, 85 percent of the valuation. So all you had to do is find a property that was 15 percent below market value or more and they would lend you the full purchase price. So you get property for nothing. Yeah. And I thought this was very dodgy. Uh, again, going back to that frightened little individual, people don't believe that, that I'm very much rule orientated, you've got to follow the rules and all the rest of it. Uh, and they look upon me as a bit of a cowboy, certainly the council do, uh, when in fact, I couldn't have survived this long mm -hmm. if I did break the rules. Yeah. Um, stretch them as, is one thing, knowing where you, you can and can't get away with it, and especially now because I'm high profile, they'd just love to get my head on the stake, uh, and a number of them have tried, mm. I assure you. So you get a bit paranoid as well. But going back, say, to the original story, um, I get started. I probably wish there's people like you and I around who I go to and say, how do I do it? Because there wasn't. Yeah. Uh, all you had is other landlords. And all oh, due respect to other landlords, they won't even give you the snot off the end of the nose. That's mm. how tight they are. Yeah, competition. You're taking the bread out of my, my mouth. That's a black country saying. Uh, I can't get the black country accent to this. Uh, so it was difficult to get any information. And most of them didn't know how they did or how things worked. The, the typical story I'd get from a, a landlord was when I started, I bought a house for 3000 I had to buy it cash. I rented it for £60 a week, 100% return. Yeah. Now the properties cost fifteen thousand. I'm still only getting about sixty pounds a week because rents hadn't gone up. Uh, the business has played out. That didn't really help. You talk to things like you know, could buy a property for a pound. I did it before it was even known. Mm. This sort of le purchase lease option. And uh, I was working in a um, a college marketing department where you got lawyers and all the rest of it. And they went, "What? You you got hold of a property for a pound? Oh, that's illegal. You can't do that. Yeah, no, no, that's not right." Lawyers went, oh, well, yes, um, un oh, I can't remember, uh, unfair, taking adv unfair advantage of people and exploiting them. No, this person wanted rid of his property. He couldn't afford to pay the rates on it. And I agreed to buy it at a good price. Yeah. And you see that, that concept of business is all the time. Business had been sold for a pound. So yeah, it's, it's, it's the same concept. Same, same, absolutely yeah. the same concept. So I you say, what would I have done differently? Um, I'd probably, uh, but then I... Here we are, it's a contradiction. If I had all the advice, I would have probably sucked it up. Yeah. I never spent all my time sitting in a corner thinking, what am I gonna do? I could do this, I could do that. What we call it, an analysis paralysis. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe I was actually an advantage in the fact that I had no advice, because yes. all I could you see, got on with it, yeah. I just got on with it without the worry, without Found the rules. Found a model, replicated it, continued to grow. Yeah. You're, you're spot on, absolutely right. That's exactly what happened. So what do I say to people now is just do it. Just get get yes. on there. The opportunity is there. If you can, do it. Um, and uh, you can't copy. You can see what I do and follow the, the pattern and it's still available. But going back to when I started, what should I do? Mm -hmm. I've got these regrets, the missed opportunities. But I know that if I went back to the same position, I'd probably be too frightened to take yes. advantage of it. So properties not get rich quick, it's get very rich slowly. Well, how slow is slow? I mean, it's 10, 20 years. Yeah. That, that's uh, half a normal working lifetime uh, for people. So yes, you you can do it very quickly. I mean, I pulled off deals, which that one deal I could retire retired on. Mm. I don't because I go on to the next deal yeah. and I want another deal and, and I end up employing people to look after it, which takes away a lot of the profit. Yeah, because uh, the overheads are increasing. Yeah. It, so final question from me then. What's the most money you've ever made in a year? Uh, I don't make money. If you look at my tax returns, uh, <laughs> I rarely make any money at all. I mean, no one makes money. You sit there with the wealth in the bank. Yes. So uh, making anything, well, the whole uh, big advantage of being self-employed is you can manipulate your income so you don't. Uh, and... Uh, <sighs> I was one year period of time I was uh, probably making about three hundred thousand a year, but then I discovered capital allowances. Right. And yes. 
ticked a box and one and a half million of my income was wiped out on capital allowances. Yeah. So uh, yeah. do your maths. Uh, being in your own business gives you that flexibility um, and you should understand the rules. I don't do it for the, the, the cash. I just do it because I enjoy doing it. The, but I'm comfortable um, in where I am. I, I'm not hard up for cash uh, or paying for anything. So, yeah. That doesn't, um, it's not a motivation for me. Jim, thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure sitting and learning from you. Thanks, very much. It's been a pleasure again. Thank you so much. Remember, you're going to tell me about service accommodation. Yes, we'll do that. <laughs> Take care. We'll Thanks. do that off camera.